All right, so I got y cosine theta equals mg. Bring that over also. And I have one other substitution to make. Centripetal acceleration. What is the formula for centripetal oh, acceleration? Negative J. Negative V divided by R. V squared over R. Oh, that's the it. negative J hat is telling us towards the center. I established that as my positive direction already. So I'm just going to put V squared over R here. So again, Y sine of theta is equal to M V squared over R. Sometimes the textbook will say the formula for centripetal force is mv squared over r. That's just m times centripetal acceleration. Well, that's going to be negative v squared over r. So this is negative j hat. Well, the, sorry, your question again, Giovanni? Oh, that's going to be negative v squared over r times j hat. Uh, the negative j hat is a directional thing. That says it's pointing towards the center. And I established towards the center as my positive direction. So if I want to figure out what is the speed that required, what is the speed required in order to take this turn without friction, without that ideal, it puts, as I did on one test, Mr. Freeze came along, froze the entire thing, zero friction, because that's as close as we can get, really, for most of life. We have zero friction. What is that optimum speed? Well, solve for B. Is it? mv squared divided by r? Yes. Okay. mv squared divided by r. Now, to solve for v, there are a couple ways of doing this. I know I have two unknowns. In a normal problem, you'll have the radius, you'll have the speed. Uh, sorry, you'll have the radius, you'll have, you'll know what planet you're on, you'll have the angle. In that situation where I know r, g, and theta, my two unknowns are v and y. I need to get rid of the y, then my only unknown is v. In a situation like this, there is a simpler task than solving for y and going over there. I'm going to divide the left-hand side, I'm going to divide the right-hand side. Because if I divide the left-hand side, the y's will cancel out, and I'm left with sine of theta or cosine of theta, otherwise known as So I have tangent of theta is equal to, over here, my masses cancel out, and I'm left with v squared over r divided by g, which is v squared over gr. So my optimum speed is the square root of g times the radius of curvature times the tangent of theta. So would it matter if, like the way you write it, if you write it cosine y cosine theta equals mg, and then you have y sine theta equals mv squared over r, then you divide those? Like, would it matter what order? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, what oh. is written on top and what's written on bottom? Uh, tangent is sine divided by cosine, and so since calculators typically have tan, I, I prefer sine over cosine. Okay. But, I mean, if you did it the other way, you'd have cotangent, and you just flip it for your calculator's purpose. So this would be the ideal. So if we just plug in, just do a quick plug and jump here. Radius of curvature is 100 meters. And the bank is, we'll just say 20 degrees. We're on Earth. What is that optimum speed? to take it I got 46.82 meters per second that is more than I was expecting. 100 meters. Anyone else got that? 
Yeah. Are we supposed to stay in radians? Or no, we're in degrees. Now? Oh, we're in degrees now. Oops. That's why. Yes, sir. 18.89 degrees. Yes, sir. 18.89. Oh, excuse me, not degrees. No. Meters per second. About 40 miles an hour. So now, if we travel 20 meters per second, which way would friction act? If there is friction, if you drive 20 meters per second, which way would friction act? Yes. Because if you drive over that optimum speed, your car wants to slide up. If you're driving 10 meters per second, which way would friction act? Onward? Yeah, because your car wants to slide down. Wait, where do you say that? Sorry. So if, if that's that optimum speed, you hit that, you drive at that speed, your car's not going to slide up or down in our nice ideal world. If you drive faster than that, your car wants to move towards the outside, so friction is going to be acting down the ramp. Okay. And so friction will be part of the centripetal force then. Okay. And if you're driving slower than that, your car wants to slide to the bottom, so friction will act the other way. So in this case, that's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot. So another key point here is that we are not changing f -tom. We're The centripetal force is going to be some combination, one of those, or some combination of those forces. So we don't need to come up with a new, we can still stick with f -tom. No Patanga? Pardon? No Patanga? No. So is this like the reason why when you spin something inside like a long tube, it keeps going up and up? Am I... Does that make sense? If you, it keeps going up and up. Until it gets up the tube or something? Is this the whole reason why? Um, so, so I see... I, the, the situation I'm thinking of... Alright, so if I spun it slowly, yeah. and then I picked up the speed... Mm -hmm. In that particular case, we did our force diagram. I have some angle theta here. I have weight acting down. I have tension acting along the line of the string. If that's theta there, this is theta here. So I end up with the tension times the cosine of theta is my centripetal force. And then I have tension times the sine of theta uh, opposing the weight. My equations of motion, Ft cosine theta is equal to m a sub c or b squared over r. I'm going to go ahead and make the substitution now. And then Ft sine theta is going to be equal to mg. I skipped some steps. If I divide, and I'm going to divide this divided by that, I get tangent of theta is equal to, uh, so that divided by that, I have gr over v squared. As the speed increases, my fraction gets smaller. As the fraction gets smaller, my angle has to get smaller. So as I spin it faster, from, from the math point of view, the angle has to get smaller in order to balance out. Okay. Would be like I'm trying to imagine it if it were on like a if there were like a if you were looking at it on like a horizontal axis. So if you're going slow, that angle is pretty big because it's dropped down from that axis. It doesn't have much speed, but as you spin it, it can get to yeah. okay. okay. And this might be an answer to. I don't know if it was a 151 centripetal motion lab or the 251 version. Anyway. Seems like there was some other absolutely brilliant comment that was going to come up here. Okay, not particularly brilliant, but I'll leave you with this. You know what? I'll just leave you. <laughs> now, the... I'll say a, a potentially obvious thing. From an inertial point of view, as I'm spinning it around, it wants to go in a straight line. As I spin it faster, it's, it, 
there's a certain amount of centripetal force keeping it in, but as I spin faster, I'm exceeding what it's giving. So it starts to move farther away from the, from the center of the axis. Yeah. And as it moves farther away, that angle gets smaller. Now, there's another complication in here because as the angle is smaller, the radius changes. Because if that rope is the same length, that's my radius as it's faster, that's my radius when it's smaller. Uh, that is something that we'll deal with. But if we draw a circle, it would be the same radius. No, it would because the circle, the radius is horizontal. Oh. It's not at a jaunty tilt. That's what messes most people up on this. They keep wanting that to be the radius of the circle when the radius circle is this way. Can you show an example of that? Of like how is it to make the radius smaller? All right, so right there on a if it's a low speed, the radius would be from where that where the stopper is to the center of me. Okay. As I increase that, so it starts out slow speed like this. And so the radius again is the horizontal distance from here to basically where my hand is. As it gets faster, the radius is farther away. The stopper is farther away than basically a, okay. Okay. I know that a virtual vertical, vertical, whatever. So, okay, yeah. So. So you know what a Beyblade is? What a what? A Beyblade. <laughs> so like... <laughs> uh, you have to say it one more time. <laughs> so like... So what if there was an object spinning around by itself but in a high speed? Would it... Would it affect... So like, would it still go to the opposite direction from the axis? Would it affect it anywhere? Wait, so you have okay. an object on... Okay, so there's an object that's spinning on its own center. Oh. Top. So, yeah, top, there you go. Okay. And then... It's spinning around another circular plane, so it's so the it's spin, spinning around. It's so it's something spinning on us. something else that's spinning. No, it's spinning on something that's circular, just like a like the race that we're doing, right? Like it's like a ball. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. and then I would that so would the speed of the of the rotation of the object itself signify how far and how far it can go from the center? Does that make sense? There is a there would be a correlation between how far off the side of the ball, which affects the radius, which affects the radius based upon how fast it's going. Okay. You would need to know basically the curvature of the ball to nail that down. Okay. I was also thinking in um, if you've ever watched the slow mo guys. Yes. Some of you have. Did you see the one where they shattered the CD? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they spun that so fast because you have all these forces trying to hold it together. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you reach a breaking point, and the, it shatters. I I cannot do that justice. I, it is worth it. If you've never watched the slow mo, guys, I highly recommend it. That's a cool video. Anyway, so long, farewell. <laughs> uh, don't forget, we have a test on Monday.